TV7 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Shalom and good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem and in today's top stories. Israeli security officials assess that Israel and Lebanon are not on the verge of war, but they do not rule out prospects of miscalculation escalating tensions. The Biden administration rejects reports about reaching agreement in broad terms for Saudi-Israeli normalization. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad claims Israel has ulterior motives in their strikes against Syria. Israel and Lebanon are not on the verge of war. While tensions are at their highest level since the days which preceded the Second Lebanon War of 2006, the presiding assessment by senior Israeli security officials in Tel Aviv is war is not imminent. Israeli security officials believe that the Iranian proxy Hezbollah remains determined to carry out provocative acts along the border fence with Israel amid unrelenting activities by the IDF to construct a fortified barrier near the border. This barrier will undoubtedly challenge Hezbollah's operational plans once war erupts. And while Hezbollah operatives have thus far limited their provocations along the border to nonviolent activities for the most part, Israeli officials believe that if those provocations turn violent, it could result in rapid escalation of hostilities. Therefore, the explicit threat voiced by Israeli Defense Minister Yav Gallant earlier this week was directed at Hezbollah's Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah. It aims to emphasize that Israel is not interested in war. Nevertheless, any miscalculation by Hezbollah's Secretary General could rapidly result into war that would per Jerusalem's top defense official, return Lebanon to the Stone Age. It is important to highlight that security officials here in Israel said that Hezbollah's actions would not change the pace at which the border obstacle will be built in the next number of months. Meanwhile, Hezbollah continues to prepare for prospects of war with Israel, effectively smuggling weaponry from Syria into Lebanon. During the course of these activities, an incident occurred last night in which a truck transporting munitions for the Iranian proxy overturned on a downhill turn near the Christian-populated mountain town of Kahale. When a group of local residents arrived at the scene, Hezbollah operatives transporting the truck made every effort to keep the residents at bay, efforts that quickly turned into a deadly gun battle. According to Lebanese security sources, as a result of the gun battle, two people were killed, including one Hezbollah operative and one local Christian resident. And while this incident is yet another reminder to Hezbollah's smuggling of weaponry into Lebanon, another anecdote includes an ongoing visit by the RGC Quds Force commander, Major General Ismail Kaani, who is currently holding meetings in Beirut with Hezbollah's Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah. Today's meetings come nearly two months after Kani boastfully proclaimed that Iran's leadership in the war in Israel has prepared Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Houthis or Ansar Allah in Yemen to help the so-called axis of resistance in Palestine, which is a regional reference to internationally designated terror groups that, similar to the Ayatollah regime in Tehran, openly aspire for Israel's annihilation. Turning to Damascus, where Syrian President Bashar al-Assad accused Israel of lying about the true reason behind strikes against Iranian targets in his country. In his first televised interview since Damascus restored its membership at the Arab League, Assad insisted that Israeli strikes started when his forces began achieving victories. <laughs> They target the Syrian army under the issue of the Iranian presence and it will last as long as Israel is an enemy and as long as we can thwart the plans of the terrorists, even partially. Because these strikes started when Syrians began to achieve victories and battle at handed, considering that we have not finished yet. The leader of Damascus went on to address efforts by Ankara, under Moscow's mediation, to reach arrangements with the aim of alleviating tensions. Asked whether he would agree to meet with President Recep Tayyip Erdogan to that end, 
Assad stressed that he did not see a reason for such a meeting to take place. It is important to note that there is a reported uptick in reported attacks by Turkish forces against Kurdish militias, primarily in areas in northeastern Syria, which are essentially controlled by the U.S.-backed SDF forces. Meanwhile, speaking about challenges facing Syria in relation to its post-war reconstruction, President Bashar al-Assad acknowledged that the greatest challenge to his regime includes the U.S.-imposed Caesar Act, which included stringent list of sanctions against the Assad regime that was signed into law by former President Donald Trump in December of 2019. The Caesar Act is an obstacle, no doubt, but we managed in numerous ways to bypass this law. It is not the biggest obstacle. The biggest obstacle is the destruction of the infrastructure by terrorists. The bigger obstacle is the image of war in Syria that prevents any investor from coming to deal with the Syrian market. The biggest obstacle also is that you can destroy economic relations in weeks or months, but you need years in order to restore them. So it is unrealistic to expect that these relationships, which began to look closer to normal, would lead to economic results within months. It is important to highlight that while the Caesar Act, which is short for the Caesar Syrian Civilian Protection Action, clearly bites into the Assad regime's capacity to efficiently function, a new bill dubbed the Assad Regime Anti-Normalization Act of 2023 was introduced to the U.S. Congress Committee on Foreign Affairs on May 16th earlier this year. A bipartisan group of U.S. House representatives are aiming to double down on efforts to isolate the Damascus regime by prohibiting any official action to recognize or normalize relations with any government of Syria that is led by President Bashar al-Assad, among others. In other news, a report published by the Wall Street Journal yesterday announced that the U.S. and Saudi Arabia have agreed to broad terms regarding normalization between the kingdom and the state of Israel. Citing a number of officials, the report noted that officials are now hammering out details of a deal which they hope to cement in the next 9 to 12 months. According to the report, which circulated extensively, the United States and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have agreed on the broad contours of a deal for Riyadh to recognize the Jewish state in exchange for Israeli concessions to the Palestinians, U.S. security guarantees for the kingdom, and American assistance in helping the Arabian monarchy construct a civilian nuclear program. Nevertheless, in response to this report, the Biden administration insisted that its premise vastly overstated the reality of the situation. I saw that uh, report. I think it vastly overstated the reality of the situation. Uh, we continue to discuss the possibility of normalization uh, of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia with uh, Saudi Arabia with Israel. Uh, the Secretary has traveled personally to the region to, to discuss this. Uh, there are a number of matters that are under discussion between the three countries uh, and we'll continue to, to, to um, we will continue to work towards that aim, recognizing that um, it's a difficult, uh, it, it is a, a long and difficult process, but I, I think the, the, the reports that we have reached some sort of agreement vastly overstate where things stand. Miller did acknowledge, however, that progress was achieved in recent days, even though there is still a long road to go before such an agreement is reached, if at all. I will say that we've had productive conversations. There's a number of issues that we have discussed, both with the Israeli government and with the Saudi government. Those conversations continue. I expect there will be uh, more happening in coming weeks. We've made progress on a number of issues. I'm not going to get into what the progress is, but it is still a long road to go um, uh, with an uncertain future. But it is a, an important initiative that we think we should continue to pursue. It is worth noting that senior U.S. officials have told TV7 that they did not see a reality in which Washington could indeed achieve ratifying a defense treaty with Saudi Arabia at this stage. Nevertheless, the officials commonly stressed the high value which Washington places in its partnership with Saudi Arabia, which was once again put on display on Tuesday when the amphibious ships USS Batan and USS Carter Hole which include roughly 3,000 U.S. sailors and Marines, 
operated together in the Red Sea with the HMS Taif. According to the U.S. Naval Forces Central Command, the joint operation demonstrated the strong partnership between the U.S. Fifth Fleet and the Royal Saudi Navy. Meanwhile, at the Pentagon, Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh was asked about the Marine deployment in the Middle East, whether it would indeed include U.S. Marines manning commercial vessels with the aim of deterring Iran's RGC Navy from harassing commercial shipping in the strategic region. I don't have an announcement to make in terms of any um, of our sailors or Marines on commercial ships at this time. Um, we've continued to see Iran dis uh, or the IRGC dis uh, disrupting the free flow of commerce within the region, which is why the secretary made the decision that he did to um, deploy uh, capabilities and more forces into the region um, to disrupt uh, the IRGC from continuing its um, activity within the Strait of Hormuz. Um, I don't have any more additional information to provide other than what CENTCOM has already previously announced and what you know we have put out um, from this podium. There's nothing additional that I can really comment in terms of uh, other ships. Thank you for watching TV7 Israel News. I would like to point out that TV7 is a donation-based ministry. Therefore, if you're blessed by our productions and would like to help support keeping our programs on air, please consider making a donation. You can do so by visiting our website at www.tv7israelnews.com. Separately, I would like to encourage you, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and salvation of Israel. I'm Jonathan Essen wishing you an Erev Mevorach, and God willing, we'll see you again tomorrow at the same time.